Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Oxier, and um, just to give a little bit of context, um, as Kate said, thank you so much for that awesome intro. Um, I'm an author of children's books, um, and just so at least you can see them way back there. And I have physical copies here even. Um, uh, I've written two books so far. The first book is called Peter Nimble and His Fantastic Eyes, and it's the story of a small blind orphan who also happens to be the greatest thief who ever lived. Um, and that came out in 2011, and uh, I've been kind of touring with that book and uh, spending a lot of time uh, talking about this book and literacy with kids all over the country. And then uh, very exciting for me is my next book is coming out this May. Uh, it's called The Night Gardener. Um, this is this, uh, it's, it's basically the story of two abandoned children who discover this ancient mysterious tree that seems to be able to grant their heart's desires, but only at a very dangerous price. And, uh, and it's this kind of creepy haunted house story. I'm very excited about it. Um, when it comes out in May, you should all buy 100 copies. Um, <laughs> so, um, but uh, also I have a little bit of info there. So if anyone wants to become my Twitter friend, because now I'm in Pittsburgh and I'm looking to uh, develop community with uh, creative people in the city, my Twitter handle is at Jonathan Oxier. You can also visit me on the web at thescop.com, which is a blog I run where I talk about children's books old and new. All right, uh, so getting that stuff out of the way, um, now we're into the talk. Uh, the title of this talk is Childhood as Source Material, um, which my wife told me was a super boring title. Um, so, <laughs> so I decided to spice it up by adding a picture. Um, so I, I drew this, um, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> so there's a T-Rex and he's fighting a unicorn, which is kind of action packed. I d think we all know how that fight's gonna end. Um, but, uh, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> So today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about childhood and about what it means to write for children. Um, but before any of that, I will ask you to bear with me as we go back and set up a little bit of history. Um, childhood was actually a, a pretty new concept. Uh, for the first several thousand years of human history, children were not viewed as special, unique creatures, uh, but more like this as miniature little adults wearing grown-up clothes and doing grown-up things and often sent to work in grown-up factories or um, in, in professions. Um, they were just miniature humans. Um, I don't know if any of you come from uh, like Orthodox or even Roman Catholic traditions where you've seen a lot of icons. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, the pictures of uh, the Virgin Mary uh, with a super creepy looking baby Jesus who looks like a tiny 40-year-old man who's like balding and long fingers. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so really what you're seeing is uh, what at that time was the contemporary view of childhood. Children were just shrunken down humans. There was no difference. But sometime in the 17th and 18th century, uh, a new idea began to take hold in the world, and that idea was called childhood. Uh, it really is due to philosophers like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, who argued that childhood, those years when you were a kid, were a special time in human development um, and it required special attention. Um, children shouldn't be worked like adults. They should be allowed to grow and explore and play and learn. And this idea caught on in a big way. And by the time we get to the 19th century, um, this notion of the pure, innocent child has become accepted fact. And uh, children are now seen as darling little angels. They're innocent and they're sweet. And this notion still thrives today. Every single time you hear someone talk about getting in touch with their inner child um, or having faith like a child or feeling like a kid again, buried in all of those statements is this idea that adulthood is somehow the source of misery and that we all just need to revert to our truer, more innocent child selves to be happy. Now, there's clearly some good that has come from this development, um, this new idea about childhood. Uh, it's pretty you know, obvious to say that kids are better off today than they were in the Renaissance. Um, but there is one problem with this notion of idealized childhood, and that is it doesn't fit with one basic fact. Ch <laughs> childhood is the worst. Um, I mean, admittedly, some parts of childhood are pretty great, but also 
It's terrible. It's agonizing. You have absolutely no power. You have no input, no voice. Everyone around you is smarter and stronger and faster than you. You're literally a dependent. Um, have, has anyone here about a year ago, I think it caught on, uh, seen that Tumblr uh, that that one dad wrote that was called Reasons My Kid Is Crying? Um, and he would post pictures for like reasons his like toddler was bursting into tears to explain the context. And uh, I, I pulled up a couple of them because I think they really <laughs> explain just how awful. <laughs> so, well, that makes a little bit of sense. Um, there, <laughs> there was this one here. Um, As, as, a, as a child uh, or a, a parent of a one and a half year old, I can attest to these sorts of moments. Um, so, uh, so really, uh, it's only once we're out of childhood that we pine for those simpler days. And if you don't believe me, um, I would uh, defy any of you when these doors open in an hour or so uh, to crawl through the museum and find uh, a single eight year old who would not kill to be nine years old. Right? We want to grow. Um, humans crave autonomy, they crave control over their environments, and childhood is marked by a lack of both. And speaking of lack of autonomy, uh, that includes a lack of real buying power, um, which brings us to one of the central problems of my career as a children's author. Um, <laughs> I write books for kids. Kids don't have money. Um, I write for an audience that cannot buy my product. And children's publishing is one of those uh, tricky creative markets where the customer is different from the audience, right? There's the customer, the people who pay, um, parents, teachers, librarians, they buy my books, hopefully, uh, but it's the children who are meant to actually read and appreciate them. So in a lot of ways, I'm serving two masters with potentially very different expectations and standards. And that gap between customer and audience can be really tricky to navigate. Um, Anyone who's ever uh, been in advertising or even seen Mad Men um, can probably identify with this problem. Uh, you know, every single week, every single time they pitch a new product, really what you're seeing is this notion that it doesn't matter how brilliant your ad for Heinz Baked Beans is, if Mr. Heinz doesn't like it, uh, it's never gonna see the light of day. And so striking that balance between kind of pleasing both masters is, is really a, a major challenge. And there are a few different ways that you can handle this tension. And so first, I think, uh, let's look at the extremes. We've got the customer versus audience. And on one end of the spectrum, um, you've got uh, basically this idea to make it all about the customer. Don't even think about the kids or the audience. Just think about the parents, right? Uh, what are the parents going to buy? And every single company who's trying to sell kale to toddlers um, <laughs> is really doing that. They're appealing to parents and the sensibilities. And they're appealing to the fact that the parents know what's best for the kid nutritionally, even though that means liquefied barley, kale, spinach drink. Um, uh, on the other side of the spectrum um, is the pure audience model. Forget about the parents. Make it all about the kids. Give them exactly what they desire and crave, maybe not what they need. Um, we can call that the Happy Meal model. And by that model, basically, the idea is kids are going to go so insane for this thing that they will force their parents to buy it. Um, and you know, no parent is happy to feed their children McDonald's, but uh, they're happy to shut their kids up uh, for a few minutes while the kid eats a Happy Meal. Um, and at first blush, though, I would say that the, the pure audience model looks more artistically pure. Um, you're putting your audience before the, com you know, the idea of commerce. But also, that's not always true, because especially, at least for writing for children, um, your audience, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, stick with the food metaphor, appeasing your audience is really different than feeding them. Um, and as gross as kale may taste, uh, too many Happy Meals will kill you. Um, so, uh, I, and I think about this, I think this is important to talk about because even an example from my own life, um, when I was kind of uh, stuck in the reading model where it was pure audience, I was able to make all the decisions and I was choosing the things that really appealed directly to me. And what that meant was uh, when I was about 10 years old, even though I could read, I was a pretty strong reader, but I pretty much stopped reading books. Um, instead, I fell in love with comics, uh, which are pretty much, at least in the 90s, the happy meal of literature. Um, <laughs> and those became all I would read. And as cool as Spider-Man and the X-Men are, and as much as I enjoyed them, uh, those stories didn't really challenge me to grow as a person. And um, because that's all I was reading, that pretty much meant I didn't grow as much as I should have. And we all know what happens to the comic reading kid who grows up into the comic reading man. Um, <laughs> he's suddenly a little less cute. Um, 
so both of those tactics, the kale and the Happy Meal, are, are extremes. And like most things, the wiser course actually falls somewhere in the middle, right? The best food is both good for you and delicious. The best books are both challenging and entertaining. And so what do you do? Um, well, for me, the only way to resolve this tension uh, is by writing for both things at once. I write for the adult, the teacher, the librarian, these gatekeepers who know what will challenge a reader and help them grow. But I also write for a kid because the kid knows what he likes, and if he doesn't like it, he's not going to stick around. Now, it's easy enough for me to write as an adult because I am an adult, and I know what would interest me. Um, but it gets trickier when I'm having to write for a kid. And I found the only way I could really crack that problem was to stop thinking about kids in the abstract and start thinking about myself as a 10-year-old because, if I'm honest, that's my real audience. I'm not writing for every 10-year-old in the world. I'm writing for me when I was 10. And I was kind of a weirdo, so it's a bit of a gamble whether other kids will you know, connect with what would have worked for me. Um, but that's the one thing I feel like I have control over, and that is my real audience. And I'm not just writing for 10-year-old me, but I'm also kind of writing as him. Uh, he writes a scene, I write a scene. Um, and we kind of uh, collaborate together. So looking for an example, um, for example, at my first book, uh, Peter Nimble and His Fantastic Eyes. I mentioned it's this story about this small blind orphan who also happens to be the greatest thief who ever lived. And I started with what interested me as an adult. Uh, I have a long time fascination with literature of the long 18th century. Uh, that was sort of the last point in Western history when magic and science were allowed to coexist. And I wanted to tell a story whose language and themes harkened back to writers like Jonathan Swift and uh, Samuel Johnson. But th those people, their writing is very dense and slow, and it's not for kids. So what I tried to do was um, take those themes and that language and pair it with a story that was funny, um, that was action-packed, that had a much more contemporary structure. And that kid writing part, kind of fitting it to that, was difficult because, as I said, I'm not a kid, and I can sometimes forget what it means to be stuck in childhood, which we've established is the worst. Um, <laughs> So here are kind of three practices that I adopted to help resolve this issue and sort of get to that place of understanding my former self. And I'm bringing them up because I think they apply to the larger question of creating for an audience that isn't us. Um, so the first thing we do, uh, these are very simple and they work for me. I don't know if they'd work for other people, but uh, the first thing you do is um, do, what, do what they do. Do what your audience does. Engage the practices in the practices of your audience. And for me, um, this really meant getting back to the things that I loved when I was a kid. Uh, namely, when I think about what I spent most of my time doing, uh, my main passion was drawing. Uh, my mother is a painter, and I spent most of my childhood basically drawing comic books and superheroes, because that's what I read. Um, and as I got older, I, I really I, I thought that was what I was going to do for a living. And, and this thing happened where I started to take my work more seriously. And I didn't just want to draw and paint. I wanted to be good. And long story short, uh, the pressure became so great that I eventually stopped drawing altogether because I figured if I can't, if I can't actually have the career that I've been shooting for, I don't want to do it at all. Um, I don't want to fail like that. And uh, later on, once I grew up, um, I started writing children's books, and that actually coincided with another uh, shift in my life uh, when I returned to drawing. And for the first time, I wasn't drawing um, kind of these beautiful works of art, but instead I was drawing pretty much exclusively um, in books that look like this. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, this is just a plain uh, black spiral bound field book. The paper is pretty crappy. Um, I kind of ditched my very serious, like a nice artist sketchbooks and moleskin books, um, which are pretty, but uh, a little precious. And instead of using all my nice pencils, I just used a, a plain black ballpoint pen that I could get from anywhere. Um, and, and the pen was important because it meant I couldn't erase. So if I made a mistake, I had to live with the mistake. And even if I did accidentally draw something that was really beautiful, it was on crappy paper in spiral bound notebook, so I couldn't do anything with it. Um, and that was intentional because I wanted to remove the ability uh, to strive for perfection in this. And I should say that, you know, in my life, I do strive for perfection. Um, but in the world of this journal, I wanted to play. Um, so however obsessive I am about my manuscripts, um, the stuff on the fringes, things like this, I wanted to just uh, get rid of ideas of polish and presentation and just kind of engage with it the way my former self would have. Do what my kid would do. Um, another uh, example of this is I also started um, reading what kids today are reading. Um, and it's, oh, it's always fun when you grow up and kind of come back to like, oh, what are, what are kids, you know, I remember what I grew up on, but what are kids these days reading? And, um, and I started doing that not just as market research, but I did it with an, 
earnest desire to enjoy it in the same way that they did. So I wasn't trying to, I, I didn't have an eye to kind of copy what was successful. I wanted to genuinely immerse myself in it to love what my audience loved. And my favorite example of doing this actually came from my friend Tom Engelberger, who is um, the author of the New York Times bestselling mega series, the Origami Yoda books, which are delightful and wonderful. Um, and, uh, and he has m literally millions of kids who adore these books and flock to him to talk about uh, just their life and growing up in middle school and how much they all love Star Wars. Um, and uh, because his books kind of tangentially deal with a kid who loves Star Wars. Um, and once when I was hanging out with him, I made the offhand remark that uh, Phantom Menace was a terrible movie, which is pretty much given, I think. Um, <laughs> and I was totally shocked by his response, because I remember he looked at me, he's like, terrible. Dude, Phantom Menace, you get to see Darth Vader as a kid. That's awesome. And, uh, and I was like looking for like a little smirk in his face, like he was like being, and he was dead serious. And what you could see right there is how fully he had entered the headspace of the kids he was writing for. And I think that's, that level of respect and perspective um, is really one of the things that young readers respond to in his work. And so that's something I kind of take with me. When I play, I want to play the way a kid does. Um, and when I'm reading, I want to read the way the kid does. Uh, the next step is feel what they feel. Um, <laughs> You want to cultivate empathy for your audience. And in this case, for me, because my audience is 10-year-old me, uh, that means spending a lot of time kind of dredging up memories. Uh, some of them are funny, some of them are boring, some of them are weird. Um, uh, but it's a really healthful, healthy exercise because it uh, forces me to not just think about what happened, but also how I felt in those moments. Uh, we all have a version of our childhoods that plays in our head, the stories we tell ourselves about who we were and who we become, but that's not always accurate. So for me, one of the things I did was go back, when I thought about all the pivotal points in my childhood, I would go back and start um, talking to primary sources, which basically meant my parents and my sisters, and asking them if they remembered uh, you know, this point of my life and what it was like. And I was all of a sudden getting all these, this other information that I hadn't uh, absorbed as a kid um, that really changed the context of the story. And it can reveal a lot. Um, uh, you know, I, when I think about, for example, I talked about when I was 10 years old and I stopped reading. Um, that, that was kind of how I remember the story. I was 10, I fell in love with comics, comics are awesome, and it took me, you know, almost 10 years, <laughs> or five years, um, not 10. I was, by the time I could drive, I'd stopped reading comics, um, <laughs> which is healthy. Uh, but, uh, you know, my memory was just comics were so awesome, I got, it, I got really into them. And, uh, but what I didn't remember was what was going on in my education at that time. Um, if any of you guys are teachers or you work with kids, uh, you might know that generally as, as a rule in fourth grade, which is what I was at 10, um, that is when st kids start reading for content rather than pleasure. Um, so I got my first textbooks when I was in fourth grade. And on top of that, instead of um, being allowed to pick books that we were interested in, we were being given class sets of assigned reading. And, uh, and I don't want to speak ill of my teacher, but she gave us some really crappy books. Um, <laughs> They were famous books, they were beloved books, they were, you know, they had Newbery medals and things like this, so clearly adults thought they were quite good. Um, but these books had no connection to me as a 10-year-old boy. And I read them and I looked at them and I decided that if that's what fiction was, if that's what novels were, I didn't want to be a part of it. Um, so it wasn't just that comics were so awesome, it was that reading books suddenly became a lot less fun. And it's in fact that sort of exercise that led to me writing Peter Nimble. Um, because in writing that, what I was really trying to do was write the book that I wished someone had been able to hand to me when I was 10 years old. So now we go to the last thing. Um, we got to do what they do, feel what they feel, and be where they are. Um, it's important to foster real relationships with your audience. Um, that's one of the best ways to develop uh, true respect and a true understanding of how they operate. Um, this last piece didn't fully come into play for me until after I had written my first book, at which point I began visiting schools and libraries all over the country and talking to kids about reading. And talking with actual kids has changed the way I approach storytelling. Um, it's a constant reminder, first of all, of the first thing we talked about, which is that childhood is hard and kids need all the help they can get. And it makes me feel humbled and makes me realize that it's an honor to be involved in any way. Um, but I'm not just there to help them. I'm also there so that they can help me um, because kids are super honest and they will tell you what they think of a book. <laughs> um, and it's not just books. Uh, when I'm doing these assemblies in front of crowds of kids, they're not afraid to show that they're bored. And what, if, seriously though, but what, 
That's a huge gift, that level of feedback, because it lets me know straight away if something's not working, and it's pushing me to always grow and improve myself and, and engage with them in more meaningful um, and effective ways. And being near my audience, um, uh, I mean, lastly, and this all fits within it, is kind of this constant reminder um, that what I like as an adult is not always exactly what my audience likes. Uh, much as I admire um, the kind of image of the tweedy, bespectacled author talking about the origins of neoclassical literature, um, that isn't what a kid wants. A kid wants to be engaged and entertained. And I know this for a fact because, searching memories, uh, I, I remember when I was, I think, 12 years old, I saw, the, the only time as a kid I saw an author, he came to the middle school I was at, and, uh, and he had just come off of a, winning a huge award. And so when he, when he showed up there, you could, you know, he was kind of wearing that and very proud. And he wanted to talk about what interested him. So he talked about awards and, uh, and the history of literature and the lonely creative process and how no one believed in him when he was young. And look at him now. And I was super bored and a little like kind of turned off by it because I'm like, dude, we're all here watching you. And this is you decide just to vent like, <laughs> like, the, like, <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> It just felt, it felt weird, and really it was a lack of perspective. In that moment, for whatever reason, um, uh, that author had forgotten that he wasn't there to entertain himself. He was there because there were 400 kids watching him. Um, and for that reason, when I started visiting schools, I decided to make sure that above all kids enjoyed themselves. Um, so I absolutely talk about literature, I talk about literacy, literacy I talk about uh, reluctant readers and what it means to, to become someone who's more passionate about books. But first of all, I show them this. Hang on. <clears throat> this is another practice from my childhood, um, and it is a yo-yo. Uh, I don't know if any of you can, can you guys see me okay? Because I'm being blinded. Um, <laughs> I don't know if the timing was right in your life, but for me, yo-yos were very popular when I was a kid, and I practiced a whole bunch, which explains why I didn't get good grades. Um, but it also means that by the time I got to high school, I was actually kind of a semi-professional yo-yo demonstrator. And, uh, and so my <laughs> super cool. Obviously, I dated a lot. Um, <laughs> um, so my job actually involved going around to, I was, like, I was like Mr. Junior Businessman. I would like call up schools, and my voice hadn't even changed. But I'm like, can I visit your elementary school and do yo-yo tricks and sell yo-yos to your kids? Um, and they would let me. It was really, uh, it, it was a different time where they weren't, they, they didn't have standards. They were like, assembly? Good. OK, we don't have to teach for an hour. Um, uh, so anyway, when I started visiting kids, I took out this yo-yo, and I decided that the first thing I was going to do is basically do stuff that I knew kids would enjoy, and I knew I would have enjoyed if that were, I was their age. So I actually use a yo-yo in my presentation as sort of a visual aid to talk about my book, Peter Nimble and His Fantastic Eyes. And I figured it would be kind of fun, hopefully, to maybe, um, to kind of end by uh, showing you guys this, just a little glimpse of kind of what I'm doing when I'm hanging out with these kids. And this is the fruit of all the thought and those steps I was talking about before. So what I want to do is I'm going to use this yo-yo to tell you a little bit about my book, Peter Nimble and His Fantastic Eyes. As I mentioned before, um, this is the story of a small blind orphan who also happens to be the greatest thief who ever lived. Uh, but what we don't know is how he became such a great thief. And so I'm going to use this yo-yo to tell you about Peter Nimble's early years. Um, I should, I should say before I do that, um, sometimes when I'm doing tricks, especially because I'm not as good as when I was in high school, uh, I can kind of get nervous and mess up. So anytime I start to feel uh, kind of like I'm about to choke, um, I would love a little encouragement from all of you guys. Uh, and it'll take the form of this. I'm going to ask a very simple question, and I would love from you a very specific answer. And the question is, how am I doing? And the answer I want to hear is, fantastic. <laughs> All right, can we try this really quick? How am I doing? Fantastic. Excellent. Okay, I like that. All right, so that feels good. Okay, <laughs> so now I'm ready to use this yo yo to tell you a little bit about Peter Nimble's early years. And in order to do this right, we need to go way, way, way back to the beginning to when Peter Nimble was just a little tiny baby. And even as a baby, Peter's life was different than yours and mine. For most of us, it was all kind of the same thing. We're born into the world, and we're brought home, and we're rocking in a cradle, and our mother or father is singing us lullabies, and it's all very touching and a little bit dull. Uh, but for Peter, it was different right from the start. He was not born into a nice family with a cradle. He was actually found in a basket that was floating at sea. And he had no mother or father anywhere to care for him. He was totally by himself. Well, that's not true. He wasn't completely by himself, because there, 
on the basket with him, actually perched right on the edge, was an enormous jet black raven. <coughs> and this bird had just pecked out baby Peter's eyes. I think we can all agree that this is a fairly disturbing and somewhat disgusting way to start your life. Um, and I hate to tell you that it actually got worse from there. This newly blinded little infant was then abandoned on the side of a little seaside fishing village. And so he spent his earliest days as a little toddler, blindly waddling this way and that down the streets and alleys. He was totally alone. He had no bed to come home to at night. He had no parents to say he loved him. And honestly, part of him was okay with that because it also meant there was no one to tell him what to do. However, there was one major problem, and that was every single time young Peter needed food or clothes, he had no grown-ups to buy it for him. So what do you think he had to do? Steal it. That's exactly what he'd do. He did this morning, noon, and night. He'd go out to the market, and he'd sniff out a particularly nice piece of fruit, and he'd reach out his little hand, and it was his. Now, how many of you guys have heard the phrase, practice makes perfect? Well, Peter Nimble practiced stealing things a lot, and he got very, very good at it. No sooner would a merchant or shopkeeper notice something was missing from their supplies, Peter Nimble had already disappeared around the corner. So like I said, he did this day in, day out, became very good. And then one afternoon, someone in the town took notice of him stealing things. And the man who noticed him was this guy named Mr. Seamus. Now, Mr. Seamus was a bad dude. He was this uh, local crook who lived in town, and he took one look at the sweet little kid stealing food to survive, and Seamus thought to himself, you know, with a little training, I could turn this boy into a great thief. And so Seamus adopted Peter. And what this meant was every single day, young Peter was locked in a cellar without food or water or even any windows. But then, every single night, when the stars rose up high into the sky, Mr. Seamus opened the cellar doors and Peter crept through the dark streets to the biggest, tallest buildings in town where the richest people lived. And Peter was so light and spry he could just hop. Oop. How am I doing? Fantastic. There we go. I like it. Okay. Uh, and Peter was so light and spry he could just hop right over the gates without the guards noticing. And by this point, Mr. Seamus had taught Peter all sorts of secret burgling arts. So the boy was able to scale right up the sides of walls without rope or anything. And he was so quick and his balance so good he could just run along the rooftops and then flip in through the windows. Now these homes were enormous mansions and they had so many hallways and corridors on the inside that it was almost like a maze. But Peter's sense of direction was so good he never got lost and by the time the owners noticed something was missing, Peter Nimble had vanished. By the time Peter was 10 years old, he was the greatest thief Mr. Seamus or the world had ever seen. But here was the problem. He was also miserable. Because day after day, night after night, year after year, he was forced to go out and steal things from nice people. He hated what he did. He hated himself for doing it. And he longed for something more. And then one rainy afternoon, he stole a treasure that changed his life forever. And those are the early years of Peter Nimble. How am I doing? Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. That's everything, guys. Um,